Rural hospitals serve as the backbone of their communities, providing local access to care for nearly 60 million Americans. In addition, rural hospitals serve as pillars of their local economies, creating essential jobs that support families and community vitality. Amidst the COVID-19 public health emergency, rural hospitals have been faced with myriad challenges unique to their circumstances, from recruitment and retention issues to lack of broadband, vaccine hesitancy, and lack of specialty care. Rural hospitals are working tirelessly to improve health outcomes for those in their communities. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederley with AHA Communications. This podcast presents some of AHA's most distinguished experts, sharing their insights on the greatest challenges confronting rural communities today. Our moderator is John Supplett, AHA's Director of Rural Health Services. John's colleague guests include Priya Bethesia, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives, Sue Ellen Wagner, Vice President of Trustee Services, Rebecca Chickey, Senior Director of Field Engagement, and Elisa Arispakachaga, Vice President of Clinical Affairs Workforce. As we move toward recovery and rebuilding following the COVID-19 pandemic, we're guided by the lessons we've learned, which include demonstrating innovation and filling gaps in our local delivery system and models of care. The intent is to bolster infrastructure of care delivery, as well as the health of our communities. We know rural communities have been rocked by lost services and hospital closures. Yet change is taking place in rural America while healthcare leaders are actively transforming their organizations. Strategic partnerships that cut across the care continuum are enabling rural providers to improve access and advance health for their communities. Success is being driven by inspired leadership, forward thinking governance and resilient clinicians and staff. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm John Supplett, Senior Director of Rural Health Services, and this is Pathways to Recovery. Joining me for this conversation are four of my colleagues from AHA, each of whom has a unique perspective on pathways to recovery and solutions to the challenges confronting rural health care providers and the communities we serve. With me are Elisa Araspakachaga, Vice President of Clinical Affairs and Workforce, Rebecca Chickey, Senior Director of Behavioral Health Services, Priya Bathija, Vice President, Strategic Initiatives and Subject Matter Expert on Maternal and Child Health Services, and Sue Ellen Wagner, Vice President, Trustee Engagement and Strategy. Welcome everyone to our Pathways to Recovery podcast for Rural Health Services. Elisa, let's begin with you. In your opinion, what's the greatest challenge you see confronting rural providers and communities? Thanks, John, and thanks for having me. Certainly, the last year and a half has put a tremendous strain, not only on our hospital workforce, but particularly on clinicians trying to provide the care our communities need. We've seen dramatic impact on their well-being, on their mental health, and their ability to be resilient. Don't get me wrong, clinicians are among the most resilient people out there, but they have seen more death and despair than they may have seen in their entire careers, and we need to be able to support them. AHA and especially rural hospitals have done a great job of bringing those resources to their teams, but there's always more we can do. Certainly rural hospitals have been innovative in how they've thought about bringing their communities together. And I think as some smaller communities have really realized there the importance of working together to achieve what they need to achieve. But anywhere from creating spaces to decompress to asking communities to help support, to sharing uh, teams across their various organizations, rural hospitals and health systems have come together to support their clinical workforce. Now, while the clinical team has certainly been through quite a lot, the entire team and one would say the entire world has been through quite an ordeal with the pandemic. So how we can help not only our clinicians, but our entire teams see that they are valued in their communities and continue to bring them into healthcare and see the opportunities within healthcare to grow their careers. 
certainly rural hospitals have been significantly um, partnering with local schools, colleges, and other groups to make sure that they are building the pipeline, not only for supporting their teams today, but how to make sure that they have the caregivers and the teams they need uh, in place for the future. So while I think making sure they have enough workforce and are supporting their workforce may be one of their biggest challenges, I see a lot of rural providers really stepping up and getting creative with how they can do this work together. Thanks, Elisa, for sharing that. And as you know from your experience, bench strength is a real challenge for many rural hospitals. They just simply don't have the, the depth of resources to draw from. What remedies exist that you are aware of that you can share with us? Sure. Thanks, John. And certainly we are seeing hospitals get creative, whether it's partnering with local colleges um, and allied health professional schools to bring students into the workplace and help them serve as assistants and in addition get uh, clinical experience while they're there, but also partnerships across institutions to share resources where they need, including um, not just at the clinical level, but also to support IT resources that might be needed. Hospitals partnering together to understand how can they do that work as a group without needing to each individually have their own team member and the depth of resources. Thanks, Elisa. And, uh, and AHA has its own suite of tools and resources that are available to our members through our website. Rebecca, let's move to you with respect to behavioral health services. When you uh, take a look at the landscape out there, in your opinion, what's the greatest challenge you see confronting rural providers and communities? Well, with obviously my behavioral health hat on, I thought long and hard about this question. And unfortunately, I came to the conclusion that one of the largest challenges right now is suicide. The suicide rate in rural areas is almost twice that of urban areas. And in fact, in certain urban parts of the country, the suicide rate has been decreasing. But um, in rural rates between 1999 and 2019, suicide rates increased 50%. And it's not, but it's not comprehensively all aspects of rural that you need to look at. The suicides rates vary significantly by age, gender, and specific populations. This is pretty common compared to urban, but men who live in rural areas are at a greater risk of suicide than men who live in urban areas. But it's not unique to men. While women have a lower rate of suicide to men in rural areas, women in rural areas still have a significantly higher rate of suicide. When you look at age, you may think rural communities and older populations, older age communities, but in fact, the statistics have shown that it's those individuals in their 20 or 30s who live in rural communities that have a higher rate of suicide. When you add in the mix of the large number of veterans who live in rural communities, the fact that many, many American Indian reservations are located in rural areas, all of those along with individuals who are LBGTQ plus living in rural communities, the suicide epidemic, as it were, is a significant challenge to the health and welfare of the communities, but particularly to rural healthcare providers, because they too are strained, as you just heard from Elisa, with workforce challenges. Thank you for that, Rebecca. Just to follow up, what would you see as a remedy to this situation? I mean, we've had conversations about isolation in rural communities, but what you're speaking to is really something different and maybe in some ways unique to our experiences in the past. What do you see as, as the path forward? Well, the good news is I think there are several paths forward. One, during the pandemic, you saw the growth and breadth of the use of telehealth. You now see with the infrastructure bill, which I believe was just sent to the president to sign, has a great deal of resources to improve broadband access to rural communities. There are more and more results of research that has been coming out lately that have shown that telehealth is actually even more effective for the treatment of some mental illnesses. I think a study that I saw this morning or yesterday showed that for bipolar disorder, telehealth actually 
has improved the outcomes of individuals who are living with bipolar disorder. So that is one potential solution. Another is the integration of physical and behavioral health, particularly in primary care settings. You and I are familiar with a podcast that we just did earlier this year, where we featured a speaker from the Northwest who has been working with a team at the University of Washington. And that rural hospital CEO speaks so highly of the positive impact of integrating physical and behavioral health in the primary care setting, what it has done in terms of outcome and access to care. He is a, a champion of that work. Then two other paths that I think can help tremendously are one, looking into the community. The four walls of the hospital are never by their own gonna be able to solve or come up with a unique solution that's going to significantly reduce suicide attempts in their community. So working through community partnerships is a third way. And finally, just addressing the stigma. I grew up in a rural community in Alabama and the stigma of seeking mental health care when you went to church with the majority of the people that worked at the hospital or your kids were in school with the majority of the people who were in private practice in behavioral health along the range of clinicians. That barrier of knowing who the clinicians are and being concerned about what might be learned if someone found out that you might seek treatment, that is a huge barrier. So beginning to normalize treatment for behavioral health, I think is, is one of the key factors as well. And all of those are interconnected. Providing telehealth means that you can receive services without having to go to a physical building and also integrating behavioral health will help as well. Thanks very much. Those are great insights and they are an excellent way, uh, an excellent path through this circumstance and these challenges that confront us. Priya, how about you? When, when you um, take a look at the landscape for maternal and child health services and you see what's in front of you, what is the greatest challenge that you see confronting rural providers and communities? Yeah, so John, I just take it a little bit higher level to say, you know, generally speaking, maternal health is a national issue right now, right? Maternal health in the United States are on the rise and maternal mortality rates have more than doubled since 1987 in our country. And this, of course, is in stark contrast to other developed countries who have seen a tremendous decrease in maternal mortality rates the same period of time. And while this is a national issue, we are seeing the impact of it more in rural communities. Part of that is because overall health outcomes are generally worse in rural communities. Rural communities also struggle to recruit and retain healthcare providers. And of course, and this in response to your question, I think the biggest challenge is access. John, when you kicked off this podcast, you mentioned rural hospital closures, and many more have limited or stopped offering obstetric services. So as a result, less than 50% of rural women have access to perinatal care within 30 miles of their home. And more than 10% of rural women drive 100 miles or more for perinatal services. So access is a huge challenge and it's had a real impact on the health of mothers and babies in rural communities. Just one statistic as an example, Rural residents had a 9% greater chance of experiencing severe maternal morbidity and mortality compared with urban residents. So again, a huge challenge and something that needs to be addressed within these communities. Well, Priya, and you, you referenced maternal deserts and how social determinants of health are really kind of influencing the access points to care. That, what do you see as, as the remedy to the situation that is challenging those providers? Yeah, so one positive thing we're seeing is more attention on this issue at a federal level, which has resulted in more funding for programs that would improve care for mothers and babies in rural communities. And there are multiple um, sources of that funding and uses for that funding, but it is positive to see that movement. We're also seeing a number of hospitals implement successful strategies that can be used by other hospitals to improve access to obstetric services. So, for example, rural hospitals are partnering with other stakeholders in a number of different ways. So they may be partnering with larger hospitals or health systems to provide training and consultations with specialists virtually. 
They may be working with them to bring specialists to rural hospitals on a regular basis to address high risk and complicated pregnancies. Rural hospitals are also partnering with community organizations to address the social needs that are heightened in rural communities and are impacting the health of mothers. They are also bringing together and building multidisciplinary maternal health care teams. So I mentioned, you know, having the right physicians and clinical teams available is a challenge generally for rural communities in terms of obstetric care, but that's been exasperated by the pandemic as well. So we are seeing hospitals develop a number of ways to fill workforce gaps and maintain access to OB services by using multidisciplinary maternal care teams that include family practice physicians, nurse practitioners, and mid-level providers who have been trained um, to perform labor and delivery services. In addition, we're seeing more and more hospitals across the country, including rural hospitals, responding to workforce shortages by engaging midwives and doulas. Third, I just want to highlight that rural hospitals have also taken a number of steps to increase access to clinicians, right, that are necessary to provide care to mothers and babies. Some of the solutions we've seen are loan repayment programs for physicians, um, a focus on recruiting homegrown healthcare providers, and, and having individuals who have trained elsewhere come back to their home community to provide services. We're also seeing hospitals work with medical and nursing schools, residency programs, and others to attract healthcare providers. And then last, I just want to say that there are a lot of ways that rural hospitals can close the gap through technology. Telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, using technology to increase access to specialty care in high-risk pregnancies. And we recently released a podcast series that talks about some of these digital solutions that can improve perinatal care. And while that series doesn't specifically focus on rural hospitals, I think there's a lot to be learned there from those hospitals' experiences on the different types of technologies that are available and the success that other hospitals have had in using them. Well, those are, those are excellent resources, and that's great insights. Thanks for sharing those, Priya. And so now, Sue Ellen, you work with the boards of these hospitals, trustees, representatives of these hospitals, and you've heard the challenges that have been shared with us by Elisa for workforce, Rebecca for behavioral health, and Priya with maternal and child health services. When you hear this, what is your reaction? How do the boards respond to the circumstances and the challenges that, that they're confronting like this in their communities? Sure. Thanks, John. And as healthcare continues to face challenges, so will boards, because the boards are responsible for setting strategy for their hospitals. And I'm actually going to replicate some of what my colleague said, because these are the challenges that boards are facing. So for rural hospital boards in particular, they need to ensure that their communities have access to care. Today's consumers are demanding quick and easy access to care. So rising expectations of these types of care quickly and easy will require boards to ensure that their hospitals work to meet these consumer needs. And as Elisa mentioned, workforce shortages can contribute to access to care and ability to provide care. So boards need to be there to support their CEOs and the staff to make sure that the care and the workforce is there. Access to behavioral health and mental health services are important, and therefore boards really need to have a behavioral health strategy for addressing these needs. And access to telehealth is important, and being able to have broadband in rural areas is increasingly important. So boards really need to understand telehealth and if and how it's an organizational priority. The last thing that I, that I will mention is recruiting and retaining diverse board members will be challenging and is very critical to our changing environment. Board members must represent the needs of their communities, and as the healthcare industry becomes more complex, it's important to ensure that there is the right expertise on the governing boards. Thank you for that, Sue Ellen. Those are, those are great examples of the challenges that, that we're seeing in the view from the boardroom now. What is it that you can do? What, what can you bring to them that will help them work through these challenges on behalf of their rural communities? Sure. Um, AHA Trustee Services has a wealth of resources and tools for boards on our website, which is trustees.aha.org. We also produce a monthly online newsletter called Trustee Insights, and you can sign up for that on our website that I just mentioned. 
I think reviewing the resources and having board educational opportunities during board meetings or maybe at different times, but either bringing board education into the boardroom, whether that's in person or virtually, or sending your trustees to conferences and different educational events so that they can learn more about the issues impacting healthcare and then take those issues back to the boardroom and then discuss how those issues impact their hospital and their communities and developing strategies to tackle some of these challenges. That's really helpful. I mean, an open dialogue among the community leaders and the stewards of these hospitals is really important to their success. As a footnote to that, we also have the Rural Healthcare Leadership Conference that is coming up in Phoenix, and it has a very strong component for board members. And in fact, about 35% of those who attend are trustees. So uh, we have a real strong component for education for them there. The strength of rural health care is critical to the fabric of American health care, and it's our mission to safeguard it, improve it, and expand it, and advance it for future generations. I want to thank my AHA colleagues for sharing their expertise and insights. Elisa Arisbach-Achaga, who's Vice President of Clinical Affairs and Workforce, Rebecca Chickie, Senior Director for Behavioral Health Services, Priya Bathija, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives, and Sue Ellen Wagner, Vice President of Trustee Engagement and Strategy. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, we never know from where the next challenge will arise, but we know that we can rely on the resilience, the resourcefulness, and the innovation of our rural health leaders to rise to the occasion. And thank you for joining me on our pathway to recovery for rural hospitals and health systems. I'm John Sublett, and this has been an AHA Advancing Health podcast.